Okay, would I, I'd like to ask our panel to come up also while I'm introducing them. We have a very distinguished panel to, who cover a lot of expertise, both in addictions, mental health, and both. Uh, and we're going to try to focus, um, as Peter was saying, what's gone well over the last 15 years since the Surgeon General's report, and then what do we need to do differently to move the system further in a more rapid pace. So while they're joining me, let me introduce them. I'll start with Kana Anamoto, who is the acting administrator of SAMHSA. Uh, most of you know SAMHSA is the federal agency charged with coordinating services within the federal government. That's a task in and of itself, but also across the country. I was talking with Kana a little earlier, saying I, I sympathize with her situation. There are probably a dozen health, mental health reform bills in Congress right now, many of them trying to change her agency, either up, down, sideways, and every which way. And I think uh, I would think you'd have to spend most of your time just tracking that and not doing your job. But um, of course, David Satcher, many of you know, he's currently the director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse. And he was the Surgeon General under President Clinton and issued the first, and I think only, mental health report, Surgeon General's mental health report. That was in 1999, and there were a lot of very uh, innovative and important recommendations uh, in that report that should help, did, has guided the field in the last 15 years and should help guide it in the future. We have Dr. John Chernansky, who's chairman of Department of Psychiatry at Northwestern, who's a prolific researcher uh, and clinician and we're glad to have him here. And we finally have Michael Botticelli, who is director of the National Drug Control Policy at the White House and leads the Obama administration's drug policy efforts. So let's give them all a, a big welcome. So Kelly and I devised some specific questions to try to get um, some identification of what are some key areas of progress over the last 15 years, and then secondarily, what else do we need to do? So I'm going to ask Kana and David to first talk about what are the five key things they think we've made progress on in the last 15 years since the Surgeon General's report, and any clear data that kind of documents that those areas of progress. But we'll start with Kana and then ask David, Dr. Satcher, to to fill in, and we're going to try to keep that first part to 10 minutes or so. Great. So, Thank right. you. Thanks, Henry. It's a, a huge honor to be here today, uh, and it's ex an exciting conversation. In the last 15 years, and I have to say, I was just a kid when the first SG report came out, um, but I did have a chance to work with Dr. Satcher on the follow-up report on culture, race, and ethnicity. I think uh, we've seen that report as seminal in legitimizing mental illnesses as, as uh, medically-based health conditions. And prior to that, I think they were often seen as social issues or character flaws. And I think the SG report helped put uh, mental health on the map. And as a result of that, we've seen things like integration, ACOs, health homes, uh, very important work happening there. A second thing I think that's happened uh, since uh, 99 is coverage expansion. Uh, I would be remiss not to remind people that open enrollment starts started on, on November 1st and ends at the end of January. Uh, and getting uh, the ACA and the Mental Health Parity and Addictions Equity Act is expanding coverage to about 62 million Americans, half of whom will get mental health and substance abuse coverage for the first time, half of whom will get, uh, who had some benefit, will get it at parity with their other health uh, conditions. And I, there's obviously more to do on that, but I think that's an important stride that's been made. The third thing, uh, and I have to make a plug for it, is that Dr. Setcher uh, made the case that culture counts when it comes to people's mental health. And that's important when we think about today is Veterans Day. You know, uh, service members, veterans, and their families, there is a culture there that we need to understand if we're going to address their behavioral health issues uh, effectively. Uh, same with uh, um, racial and ethnic minorities as well as gender and sexual minorities. Culture makes a big difference uh, before that report. I think it was a little bit iffy. It was sort of comf uh, fringe or controversial. And now it's really seen as an essential part of behavioral health services. 
Fourth issue, I would say, is the role of trauma in mental illness and, and substance use disorders. And fifth is uh, the work that we've recently seen on early intervention and prevention. The science there is just exploding, and there's a lot uh, of promise in that area. Could you just say a little bit more, kind of, about the early intervention part? What's going on there? Just to, uh, uh, so one of the things we know uh, right now is that for people who are first showing signs of psychosis, uh, recent studies have shown that from the first episode uh, to the time that person gets in treatment, the average length is about 72 weeks. So people are waiting over a year before they're first seen uh, in treatment, and yet we know that that first year is so critical. There's opportunities to change the trajectory of young people's lives uh, so that we can avert or um, uh, preempt long-term disability and, and see people uh, leading lives of, of wellness and recovery um, uh, that we didn't imagine before. And it, also on suicide prevention, there's lots more to talk about, but uh, there's also space in the early childhood work uh, that's just uh, very exciting uh, and has so much promise. Thank you. I, I would just add, add one thing that there was a recent um, multi-agency, federal agency, educational or mandate piece from CMS, SAMHSA, and NIMH, which I don't think happens that often, uh, all around this early intervention with psychosis, and that was a very important I think move yep. forward to let every payer know and provider know how important this is and what they need to do about it. So David, would you want to add to what you think are the key areas of progress since your report? Well, I think I should begin by saying amen <laughs> to what Connor has said. Um, I do want to point out that during the time that we were preparing the report is when I first met Patrick Kennedy and paid him a few visits so one of the major goals uh, recommended in the report was parity of access to mental health services. I'm not sure we were that explicit about addiction equity that came later. But I also want to point out that there were three follow-up reports to the first report, and one was mental health, culture, race, and ethnicity, and had certainly received the most attention. We also did a follow-up report on treating children with mental disorders and uh, we did a follow-up report. Our last report in that area was on dealing with developmental disorders. That's when I met uh, Eunice Kennedy and Tim Shriver uh, and, and Special Olympics. But we, we tried to look at developmental disorders from a mental health perspective in that report. So I think those were, over the next two years after the report was relief, released, we were able to release those reports. But when I think about what I've experienced, I think there has been an impact on stigma. Um, the, the way people speak out now, and it's not enough, but it's growing, was virtually unheard of, I think, before the report. So I think the report started a conversation that's uh, increasingly led people to speak out about their own problems with mental disorders as well as their families. In terms of services, and this is where I've had most of my experience in the last few years, I think there are some things that are happening that are leading us in the right direction. And I think the integration of mental health and primary care is certainly one of them. We uh, work with 10 community health centers around Atlanta in the area of integrating mental health and primary care. And I think the integration in and of itself reduces stigma because there is stigma in the health professions in the area of mental uh, illness, and I think what we have done in terms of working with primary care providers is, as I think Patrick would say, um, you, you haven't done a, a real checkup until you've also done an exam from the neck up. And I think we have been making that point to primary care providers that the brain is such an important part of the body and you can't be healthy if you're not mentally healthy. So that's going on in a lot of places throughout the country now. And then I, as I said, in Atlanta, we work with 10 community health centers. We also started a program at Grady, the public hospital, uh, I guess the largest public hospital in the South, where we took over responsibility for mental health emergencies with the goal of really reorienting emergency care in that area. In the past, people who came into the emergency room with the emergencies were put over in a corner until, quote, the psychiatrist came, which sometimes was 12 to 14 hours. 
or more. So we just decided to try to demonstrate what we could do. And Dr. Glenda Wren, whom some of you know, joined us about that time. So for three years, we tried to demonstrate that we could, in fi fact, provide more comprehensive care to people with mental health emergencies, reduced waiting time by 80%, reduced the use of restraints by 75%, and even reduced costs by 40% which turned out to be what most people were interested in. But um, we think all of those things were important. Right. But I, I'm, I'm just saying throughout the country, people are trying things, and they're intervening to try to improve the quality of care. That sounds great. Thank you. Well, our next question is, uh, Connor, we've put her on the spot twice, but she has the broadest scope, really, <coughs> of everybody here. So, and John Ternansky. So here's the question. What are the specific changes you would make in the behavioral health and general medical system that would create an optimal set of interventions that would reduce the per capita suicide rate by 20% in 10 years, the incarceration rate of people with mental health substance abuse disorders by 20% in 10 years, and decrease the number of special ed students by 20% in 10 years. And we tried to put some public health metrics on this because I think our whole system, every part of it, not just the federal or state governments or the private sector, we don't really hold ourselves accountable for moving the needle on mortality and morbidity rates, and we should, even if no one person has full responsibility for it. But in order to measure, we've seen some significant changes in heart disease and, and many cancers over the last 30 years, significant drops in mortality and morbidity rates. We haven't really seen that in behavioral health, and I hope that we'll get some good ideas about what we could do in the next 15 to 10 years that would make this, John, you want to start? Or? Kind of. I guess, uh, <clears throat> let me uh, first of all say, I'm going to come at this as a practicing clinician. I mean, these are real life issues that we struggle with every day. And as I counted, those were three questions, not, not one question, just for the record. Just okay. for, so uh, let me just maybe start off with a, a discussion about suicide. Um, I think I, I often tell my non psychiatric colleagues, other medical colleagues, that the suicide rate in this country is more than twice the homicide rate. Right. And they're shocked. Most people say, well, that can't be true. Because we hear so much about trying to reduce violence, trying to reduce homicide. If that were true, we would hear more about suicide. It's true. And yet we don't hear more about how suicide occurs and how to prevent it. So I think, first of all, getting people to understand, getting the public to understand the magnitude of the problem. I think it might be just uh, worth to reflect for a moment on what, uh, how and when suicide occurs. I mean, the vast majority of, of suicide victims are clinically depressed. This doesn't happen randomly. This is associated with particular psychiatric disorder. But even in people who are depressed and who contemplate or attempt or complete a suicide, the urge to suicide is not a constant part of their illness. Usually. It's quite transient. It comes, it goes. And it's during those moments when it's present and somebody feels desperate, desperate to act, to stop the pain, or a couple of reasons why people do this. This is the moment of danger for that particular individual. So the point is, suicide is preventable. To the degree to which we treat depression, and the degree to which we can get to people during these moments when they ha are vulnerable and they have this urge to harm themselves. Uh, if we could improve that, we could prevent suicide. We had an experience at Northwestern, I'd just like to share, it was a long experience. We, we were uncomfortable with the, with the rate of suicide in our patient population. We thought it was too high. We wanted to bring it down. We made a number of interventions and we did universal training on how to screen and assess for suicide risk. What we learned, we learned two interesting things during that exercise. One was that when people use that word suicide or suicidal ideation, many, mostly people are, do not understand each other. They have different ideas in their mind. So one thing we had to do was come to a common understanding of what suicide was and what the wish to commit suicide, what that really was in an individual patient. The second, and it's interesting, I think, in 2015, is that amongst our clinicians, there was a wide range of opinions about whether it was actually proper to intervene and to stop somebody 
from committing suicide. Some people felt that there was a limit on this, that you shouldn't really physically prevent somebody from killing themselves. We didn't quite have that right. I think we had to tackle that head on and basically establish that this is an illness-based phenomenon. And just as we wouldn't let somebody, we wouldn't stand by and let somebody die of cancer, we're not going to stand by and let somebody die of suicide. Right. So I, I would think we can establish a common language about how to assess suicide. We can, we can establish a common ethic about the, the proper way in which to prevent somebody from committing suicide. And then we can teach this to providers. We can teach it to psychiatrists. They, they need to be taught. And we need to teach it to other, other health care providers. So I've probably taken more time than I should, so I'll leave the second question That's to other good. colleagues. Thank you. Connor, you want to sure. expand that? or okay. So uh, with respect to suicide, I couldn't agree with John Moore. There is absolutely, uh, uh, there are models out there that we know uh, have demonstrated results. So if you look at the Henry Ford uh, health system in Michigan, we've seen some dramatic uh, results that when they have implemented the zero suicide model. So you have to take whole health systems, mm -hmm. and we know that people are at highest risk once they're getting discharged from the hospital. So people who have made an attempt, very high risk once they get out, high risk for rehospitalization, and high risk for completion. So you've got to have those follow-ups. You have to have those warm handoffs. You also have to get universal depression screening, and when you screen positive for depression, you have to do suicide-specific screening and then suicide-specific interventions, uh, because just 30% of people who commit suicide are already in treatment. Uh, but they're not getting the intervention that's targeted to the suicidality specifically. Um, and so we've seen with the, with the Henry Ford Foundation uh, that they have where uh, their suicide rate has gone down to 5 per 100,000 uh, when the state average is 13 per 100,000. So they have a less than 50% of the rate of the state uh, because they've taken that comprehensive approach. Countries like Scotland have also taken aggressive approaches and they've seen double digit reductions in their suicide rates over the last few years. So we can do the same thing here. With respect to criminal justice issues or, or, or jail populations, I think we're talking about how Cook County Jail is the largest mental health and mental, mental institution in the country, uh, same with LA County, uh, Rikers Island. Um, you know, there are interventions like mental health courts or, or drug courts that we know uh, can keep people, nonviolent offenders, out of the criminal justice system. Uh, there are diversion programs, work with, you know, Michael was talking about the International Chiefs of Police. We know there's things that we can work with law enforcement to do. Uh, but even moving upstream from that, uh, you know, we have to have a foundation of uh, strong community-based services uh, because without that, uh, you know, people will continue to fall through the cracks. And so we need to understand how to get crisis systems working together, law enforcement, hospitals, pet teams, mental health and substance abuse, um, all coming together uh, so that as, as people are getting into crisis, there are other options for them. And I think peers uh, will play a really important role uh, with that as well. And then for the special ed or for the, for the young kids who are falling through the cracks, um, you know, we have zero to eight programs. We know that those early years are so important. There's things like good behavior game uh, and, and um, uh, families and students together and other things that we know can keep uh, kids doing better as they grow older. Um, and then there's also uh, things that we can do, school-based mental health, uh, I mean, kids with serious emotional disturbance of all disability groups, they have the lowest high school graduation rates. Right. So compared with kids with other physical disabilities, kids that are, have, are hearing impaired, visually impaired, uh, other, uh, other kinds of uh, mobility impairments, kids with SED graduate high school the least. Uh, and there is a lot that we can do to help these kids be successful. We can do supported employment, we can work with families, we can, again, youth peer supports. I think those are vitally important. Great, thank you. Michael, we have a question for you. All right, surprise. <laughs> um, what specific changes would you make or recommend making in the addictions treatment system, in the general medical system, that would create a set of interventions that would lower opioid death rates by 20% in the next 10 years? Sure. So, so let me just say it's really a, a, an honor to be here today. And I, and I have to start out with a personal shout out that. Uh, my brother and his sister-in-law, who are natives of Oak Park, are here. And uh, we all talk about the importance of family as it relates to these issues and recovery. So I want to give them a particular shout out to do that. Um, but in, in, I, I just want to support what Kana said about the importance of coverage 
as it relates to this issue. You know, I think many of us saw the study that just came out by uh, economists at Princeton University that showed the dramatic increase in mortality of, uh, to 45 and 50 year old white men as a result of increases in drug overdoses, um, alcohol related deaths and suicide. So this is not just a, a drug crisis, this is a huge public health crisis that we have here. I will say, you know, I think there are a few interventions that we can make as it relates to the uh, dramatic increase in opioid overdoses that we have. And first and foremost, we have to change prescribing behaviors in the United States. So you can look back over the past 15 years and look at the increase in mortality, and it correlates dramatically with the increase in opioid sales and prescriptions in the United States. A study by the CDC showed that we are prescribing enough pain medication in the United States to give every adult American their own bottle of pain pills. And we know that that is often where those medications get abused. And, and I will say this, there's some underlying root causes here about that really, I think, prohibit good integration. And that's because uh, physicians and other people in the healthcare arenas do not get any training on substance use disorder. So if we're talking about integrated care, we've really got to work with our medical schools, our public health schools, our social work schools to do a better job at integrating behavioral health issues as part of, as part of core curricula. The second thing I'll say, thank you. Um, the second thing I'll say is that on the good news side, and we've known some of this for a long time, we have highly effective medications for the treatment of addictive disorders, and particularly opioid use disorders. These are dramatically underutilized in our addiction treatment system, in our criminal justice system, and in our primary care. So we've had a number of medications that are uh, uh, able to be administered through primary care settings, yet we have a very, very small percentage of physicians who have gotten trained on these medications. And talk about diminishing stigma. If you can go to a primary care setting, be indistinguishable from any other patient, and get treatment for your addiction, it, it's a game changer. So, and this is work that SAMHSA and ONDCP have been working on for a long time. The third thing that I'll say is that even though that we've known issues around mental health and substance use are chronic disorders, we're still treating them as acute and episodic conditions. So first of all, we wait till people reach their most acute phase. You know, if we can do away with the phrase hitting bottom, uh, I, I will feel like I have done my job because with no other health condition do we expect people to reach their acute condition before we think they're motivated to seek care. And the second thing is, <laughs> um, the, the, and again, this is work that we're working on on the federal level as it relates to coverage, as it relates to SAMHSA grants, is, is we know that people need a continuum of care to do better and length of time in care plays a significant role. And so, you know, one of the things that I think we, to, we need to do is not just talk about the people who access care, but the people who get to long-term recovery. And what are the structural interventions and the policy interventions that we need to put in place to make sure that we have a continuum of care. So I think we're moving in the right direction, but, but particularly as it relates to the opioid disorder issue that we have, I think those are the three things that I would say. Great. That was very... You've all been very efficient and targeted, which was great, which I was hopeful you'd do. I, let's uh, have a dialogue. I'd like to bring up a couple of issues that you all touched on. One was, of course, this whole integration thing. One of the um, that, was, that you recommended, Dr. Satcher, in your Surgeon General Report, there is a specific intervention, collaborative care and primary care to, to handle mental health and substance abuse problems. It's well-researched. And since that time, there have been some large-scale demonstrations in different systems, Kaiser, uh, the military, the VA, that have proofed this out. But probably, at this point, it's reaching less than 5% of the population. And what, one of the things that's surprising me is there's really not a, um, a national lobby or advocacy for this issue, for how to specifically intervene in providing additional behavioral health resources to primary care. And yet, our statistics tell us that the majority of people with a mental health and substance abuse problem never see a specialist. They don't see anybody in the mental health system. They see only a primary care doc, and they get sometimes great care, but unfortunately the majority of the time it's ineffective care, partly because the primary care docs don't have the time. It's not just a training problem. Many of them know a lot about mental health, 
but they don't have any psychiatric or mental health or behavioral resources to help them do a better job. So uh, I think personally that one of the things that would make a difference on suicide rates, early uh, prevention, and just treatment of all outcomes would be to deliver, implement this collaborative care model in every primary care office. So that's been a big policy push for the Kennedy Forum. And uh, actually in a very positive way, CMS is actually considering adding, have said they intend to do that, uh, payment for collaborative care, Medicare fee-for-service by 2017. Uh, if they do it, I hope they do. There's been a lot of input from a lot of organizations, some here, about how to do it, what's the best way. But to me, given that the majority of people are treated there and we know they're not very good outcomes, I don't see how you impact any public health statistic unless you beef up the quality of the care there. Because most people, particularly for more moderate mental health than substance abuse problems, comorbid with heart disease and cancer, they're not gonna wanna go see a therapist, a psychiatrist, or a community mental health center. They're gonna, and if, if supported, they can do an effective job there. So that would be one thing I would add to the likelihood. The other is, you know, Connor mentioned parity and the ACA expansion. I think that has been one of the big successes. Um, but to complete the job, and you know, we don't even have regulations for Medicaid parity seven years after the law passed. That's our biggest insurer, as everyone knows, for people with these problems. That full implementation of both commercial insurance and Medicaid parity would frankly do a lot to deliver all of these evidence-based services, the community service you talked about, Kana, ACT teams, crisis teams, residential, you know, collaborative care, those are, and those don't require a new appropriation. That's enforcing a law on the books that says you should be doing these services on par with medical. And so those, many of those evidence-based practices, I think, Kana, you mentioned, would be reimbursed if we get full enforcement of the law. You all have any response to, to those? Well, let me just say that I think when we talk about integrated care, it has to involve collaboration. Uh, and, and it means that we've got to take time to develop the collaborative team. Right. And I think that's the tough part. And our experience was developing and training the team so that the relationship between primary care providers and the mental health specialists is enhanced significantly. So our attitude is that no patient should, let me say it this way, every patient should ultimately have access to the highest level of care which they need. And that means that the primary care center has to de develop a relationship with the mental health system. And that's really, I think, coming along quite well. But I, I don't think you have integrated care just when you have primary care providers uh, examining patients for mental health problems. I think you have it when you've developed the collaboration right. and the teams and the training to make sure that every patient has, ultimately has that access. Absolutely, and reimbursement for that would drive this, so. Yeah, and a lot going on. I've been working with the American Psychiatric Association around issues related to reimbursement. And of course, a lot of that's been waiting for making sure that the rules were in place right. for implementing yes. uh, the full access to mental health services. John, you were going to, John, did, you were gonna... The other thing I would add to that, I agree with that completely, is that having an integrated or collaborative care model offers the opportunity to be proactive rather than to simply wait for, th wait for the problem to present itself in the clinic. We can screen, we can look for people who are struggling with mental health issues, intervene maybe even before it hits the level of a syndrome, where these were, were, were intervening, reducing risk factors. It goes to your uh, point about uh, prevention. Michael, were you gonna? So I, I think a couple things here, and I think you know, we're all underscoring the importance of how we do this collaborative care practices. And just a couple things of, you know, as, as I've kind of seen examples around the country where people have uh, implemented kind of integrated cap collaborative care, I, I, I don't think we can discount the role that culture plays mm -hmm. in getting people to that. I, as we've worked on reimbursement models and incentive models, um, people still want, you have to have people who still want to do this work. And so I don't think we can dismiss the role that culture plays 
in, within the medical community writ large about and a, a little bit of an unwillingness to treat people with right. mental health and substance use disorder. I would agree. Well, um, it, but the, but uh, the uh, second piece yeah. I'll say is, it, it, in, addition, in addition to coverage, I think this is part of what the Affordable Care Act does, mm -hmm. is really look by moving away from a fee-for-service based system, mm -hmm. by looking at things like the development of accountable care organizations yeah. and medical home models of tying reimbursement to outcomes, not by a procedure, yeah. I think can really accelerate that kind of integrated care models. I think that's a very good point. Well, we'll say one thing. CMS just announced a grant to the American Psychiatric Association that in co collaboration with the University of Washington, Jurgen Unitzer, many people know, is an expert in this area, to train several thousand psychiatrists in this collaborative care model. So it does a beginning to address this in a more, in a substantive way. You know, one thing, though, we didn't talk about was, and you brought it up about outcomes, that one of the initiatives that the Kennedy Forum has is it's getting ready to issue a, a public policy paper about measurement-based care or the use of standardized outcomes instruments. So um, the, surprising to me, actually, the amount of research that shows if all you add, whether you're a primary care doc treating depression or a psychiatrist, psychologist, or community health center treating whatever problem, if you add a standardized quantifiable outcomes instrument, the care is more efficient and more effective study after study, several meta-analyses. So the Kennedy Forum has come out with a, is coming out with a policy statement saying, we're recommending that every mental health professional and substance abuse professional that treats these illnesses use one of these standardized, quantifiable, validated instruments every time they see the patient or frequently if it's in a hospital. And that all primary care doctors that treat a, one of these problems does the same. That would for really no additional money in a sense or small additional, you could have a significant increase in the level of our effectiveness. And you wouldn't have to just wait on the, uh, the uh, ACOs or the, you know, the, the, the non-fee for service. While that is happening, you could sort of see a jump start. I don't know whether, whether you all, have your views on that would, anyway, as to whether you think that would move the needle. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, that which you measure is what you have an impact on, right. and I think that's absolutely mm -hmm. right, that we need to uh, boost quality and accountability in behavioral health in right. order to uh, be on par with our physical health colleagues, uh, because that is the expectation for all across healthcare. Uh, and, and behavioral health, I think, is increasingly a part of that. But, you know, when you're saying at no cost uh, or very little cost, Love. I think that's probably a relative term. Uh, it is a challenge for some of our systems uh, to to make these changes, uh, but I think we're very invested in helping them uh, to make those changes. I did, I'm sorry to, to piggyback, but I wanted to get back on the, the first question in terms of integration, and I, I agree with uh, what everyone else said, and, and that CMS is doing a lot of stuff on the innovation side and the innovation accelerator program, et cetera. But another piece of that is also extending the workforce, uh, because uh, you know health homes and ACOs, sometimes those work in larger systems, but there are also a lot of places where you don't have a lot of physicians. You might only have one physician in a county. Uh, and so how do we get that uh, specialized um, experience, knowledge, and skills out to those uh, non-specialist uh, folks, whether they're Agreed. advanced practice uh, nurses or they're PAs or physicians? Uh, because I think Michael's right, culture matters. And a lot of times uh, what also matters, if I don't have the skills, if I don't no, if I don't feel confident about how to do this, it's, you know, building the team. I don't want to deal with a patient if I don't feel like I've got backup and I don't have someone helping me, supporting me, supervising and mentoring me uh, to that's deal a, with a very specialized a very condition. good. Well, 50% well, of counties have no mental health or substance abuse right. professional in the U.S. Right. So to me, though, the collaborative care model is really a telemedicine model. So you can either embed the care managers or you, they've now come stub studies that you don't for these rural, rural primary care practices, you can not embed them. And of course, the psychiatrist consultant is not embedded. It's a phone base. So that would answer part of this. I think it won't necessarily answer those who need intensive specialty care, but it could certainly go a long way addressing some of the manpower, uh, human resource shortages on the specialty side. Right. But I could, well, David, I just you, think, and then, go ahead, David. Go ahead. That's okay. Uh, well, I just want to make the point that there's another way to emphasize the financial benefits of a collaborative or integrated care model, and that is, in a primary care practice, it's all about time. You have a very limited amount of time to see people, and anything that disrupts that workflow 
somebody coming in and bursting into tears during a routine physical exam, if you talk to internists, this, they, this is their worst nightmare, because then they have to stop what they're doing, and they have to deal with a crisis. Uh, the, you don't, even if it's not a billable activity, to have a way of having the, the, the access for that patient to go and talk to somebody, a social worker, somebody who's trained in uh, delivering mental health care in a primary care setting, so that that internist can go on to the next patient. It makes money for the primary care clinic. David, were you going to add right. something? Patient care is a team sport. <laughs> and I think one of the most difficult things that physicians have had to deal with is to recognize that it is a team sport. And you can do much more if you see yourself as a member of a team than as a loner. So I think the, the, the best way to deal with that in a way, even out in a place like Watts in the 80s, we didn't have adequate numbers of primary care providers, but we had the teams, well-trained teams. So patients came and they waited less than 15 minutes because of the way we use the team. So I think that's really critical. Well, I would agree. I think those are great comments. I've talked now to some leaders in large systems that have implemented this collaborative care. We had the medical director of Kaiser on one of our panels in, in June, and they've been doing this in many of their primary care. He said, once our primary care docs have implemented this, they love it. They do, you do have to adjust your workflow, but many of them are doing that now for medical home interventions for other medical, Ill, chronic medical illnesses. So it's an initial change, but it's good to know that some of them, their leaders are saying, once we've done this, we don't want to go back. Um, well, we only have a couple more minutes. So we, it would be good to hear if we've got some time for questions from the audience for our panel. Um, Michael, I want to thank you again for mentioning the um, real effectiveness of medication-assisted treatment, but do you have any advice for even in this own room of lots of mental health advocates, ways we can help people better embrace um, medications like methadone, buprenorphine, Vivitrol, to be helping to really respond to the opioid crisis that, uh, sadly, Illinois sort of leads the country in? Sure. So, so thank you for raising that. So we'll continue to do everything that we can on the federal level to help support that. You know, one of the things that we've talked about all throughout the day and throughout the country is the importance of a recovery movement. And unfortunately, I think because of the stigma still around medications particularly, that we haven't really focused on creating a, a recovery movement for people who found their recovery with the help of medications. And so I think we can really change the mindset of that. Uh, you know, I found that we really have to also work with our uh, our, our state legislative delegations to make sure that they understand not just the benefits, but the economic benefits of, of medications, right? So, so we know that people on medications don't die. We know that people who are on medications actually are likely to go back to emergency departments. They're likely to, less likely to go back to acute treatment services. So I think we really have to create, um, but, but you know, here's a good example where sometimes science and data don't drive public policy. Right, people drive public policy. And, and again, I think we have to make a more personal story around people who found their recovery with the help of medications. Thank Another you. question? Over here, oh. Uh, yeah, it's a quick question. I, I, this, to me, this has been a relatively narrow conversation. And I'm just wondering if you could open it up a little bit to consider two areas that are especially important to health in low-income communities, and that's affordable housing and health, and nutrition and health, neither of which you've mentioned. Thank you. Anybody want to? You know, at SAMHSA, we have a definition of recovery that talks about uh, health, home, purpose, and community. So we absolutely see people having positive health, whether that is uh, their physical health, their mental health, their behavioral health. Um, as, as well as housing, you know, uh, education, employment, and uh, social supports, as well as staying out of the uh, criminal justice system as, as kind of the whole picture of recovery. So um, it, there's also a, a piece about, I think, economic health uh, yeah. that's so vital to many people. So I, I would agree with you that, that housing and nutrition are, are, are fundamental. 
I think particularly the housing angle. So I think it's really been amazing that we've seen the evolution, particularly when you look at chronic homelessness, that the movement toward housing first models, I think really can't be underestimated in terms of what we know to be effective. But, but the other thing that I'll say is, you know, uh, the how we really look at, particularly those folks with substance use disorders and criminal, who have criminal histories, their inability to secure housing. Mm -hmm. and, and the thinking behind the Affordable Care Act was quite honestly that as long as we kept our safety net funding in place, that if we had the Affordable Care Act to pay for some of those higher end acute treatment services, that we could look at safety net funding to support some of those things that insurance doesn't cover, mm -hmm. things like housing are particularly important for folks. So I think we all have come to understand the role that housing, nutrition, exercise, other, other kinds of supports really need to be part of people's ongoing recovery and care. We, we have time for one more question. And I, I did want to remind everybody that Patrick will be signing books in the Normandy Lounge until 4 p.m. for those, and then we'll take your question. Well, hi. I have encountered a number of psychiatrists that do not take health insurance. And so having health insurance has not really solved my problem in finding care. And I think that's an issue that, that this panel and other policymakers need to address. Thank you. Well, I'll respond to that some. The, it is a problem. I think something like 60% of psychiatrists are out of network and a number of other mental health professionals as well. Um, I think that's a multi-pronged problem. One is has to do with the parity law and the lack of enforcement. So um, a number of uh, payers are paying psychiatrists less than they do other medical professions, which is a violation of the parity law. Um, some of the psychiatrists don't want to be in network because of the excessive utilization review activities that other physicians don't put up with. Um, I think those are our problems here. I think also, though, some psychiatrists that are in solo practices are kind of used to not being part of a system. That's changing, I think, with some of the younger psychiatrists. I don't know if, John, you would agree with that, who are more used to working in a larger system of care, maybe an integrated medical behavioral system. But I think that even with optimal um, psych psychiatric access in, in network, we're going to have a shortage of a lot of specialty professions, which is, again, points to the need for this collaborative care model which would expand the reach, because they are the psychiatrist and a behavioral care manager. They're handling a whole population. They're not doing one-on-one -on -one therapy. They're helping the primary care practice do a better job. Uh, so to me, those are part of the answers. Also, funding more of these more innovative digital interventions and telemedicine interventions, which allow for an expansion of the outreach of the specialty services, which uh, are, frankly, they're like 2,000 apps now out there for delivering cognitive behavioral therapy online, uh, interactive computer games. So there's a whole technology push now that is going to allow us to expand or extend the reach of what a person could do in their office. So we're going to stop here. I want to thank our panel for a I'm sorry, talk. Dr. Harbin. We had one other question. Oh, sorry. Been standing I here. can't we really. Didn't look over here. I know it's hard to see you. I, I can't see you. So. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, this question is mainly directed at Dr. Satcher, but anyone can respond. I know, Dr. Satcher, you've done a wonderful job uh, focusing on, on mental health issues as a public health issue, but also on youth violence and violence as a public health issue, and violence and, and, and mental health issues have come up today. There are two aspects of that that I wonder if you could comment on. One is the risk. Uh, for future mental health issues and even violence perpetration and victimization that children's exposure to violence suggests. And secondly, and I don't mean to be provocative, but I think this is real, the availability of firearms in our communities and in our homes. There are a greater number of suicide deaths by gun and firearms than there are homicides. And young people who are scared and impulsive or revengeful or whatever and a firearm also contribute terribly to the loss of life that we see in Chicago. I wonder if you could comment on those two things or any other uh, nexuses or whatever, the nexi that you see between violence and mental health. Well, thank you for asking the question. I was here in Chicago last week at the American Public Health Association, and that was the topic that they asked me to talk about. Some of you may remember that in 1999, when I was Surgeon General, we had the Columbine shooting, in which uh, 
15 deaths occurred, two students brought guns to school, they killed 12 other students, a teacher, and then themselves. And we've had several mass shootings since then, but we, and, and I would in no way minimize the significance of that. Over the last 16 years, however, we've had a total of less than 200 deaths from mass shootings, but we've had every week in this country over 200 deaths from violence on the street, usually black on black. Um, and I believe that the fact that we failed to treat both of those as mental health problems is a major issue. Uh, kids who devalue themselves and who are addicted to drugs, who have easy access to assault weapons. I mean, it's almost as if we're setting up a situation for that kind of violence to occur. So I think it's a major issue, and I think we have really failed to address it. Uh, I believe it's important to address mass shootings and to point out the mental health implications but I also think we ought to be bold enough to point out the mental health implications of kids on the streets shooting each other, devaluing themselves and their own <laughs> lives. That too, in my opinion, is a mental health problem. I think we've got to do it. Okay, thank you for all being here and thank our panel for a great presentation and some good ideas. So.